Good evening in Mexico. Good morning in Cambodia. On behalf of La Buena Impresión and the APSAR Authority for Site Protection and Management of the Region of Angkor, the National Authority of Prea Vihea, the Royal University of Fine Arts of Cambodia, the National Institute of Anthropology and History, and the BVVA Vancomer Foundation, welcome to this first colloquium on archaeology and restoration Mexico Cambodia. My name is Bertrand Lovejoy, Associate Professor in the Department of Humanities at the University of Monterrey, and for this conference I will serve as moderator. I will ask Master Fernando Aceves Humanas to give us some work. He is the organizer of this first colloquium of archaeology and restoration, Mexico Cambodia. Good evening. I am not the only organizer. We have a whole team organizing this event. I want to thank to the National APSAR Authority, to the Authority of Perea Vigea, to the Royal University of Fine Arts, to the National Institute of Anthropology and History, and to the BVVA Foundation Mexico for their support to organize this colloquium. Today I am very happy to introduce Yareli Haidar. We grew up together. I know her since she was a little girl and our families have been very glad to see her professional development. She has an extraordinary career. Uh, today is also with us Francisco Siqueiros. He is the author of the work art that is the image of this event, Francisco Siqueiros, is from the workshop Nopal Press in Los Angeles, and it's a pleasure and a honor to have him with us today. I'm going to share some data about Dr. Jareli Jaidar. She has a bachelor degree in restoration of cultural heritage from the NCRIM. It's the INA School of Restoration, and the doctor She's doctor in science for the conservation and study of materials of cultural heritage from the University of Florence, Italy, with, with a doctoral thesis entitled Nanotechnology Applied to Conservation and Restoration of Pre-Hispanic Cultural Heritage. She has more than 18 years of experience in the study and conservation of cultural heritage. Her work focuses on the study of constituent materials and degradation of cultural heritage, as well as nanostructured products used in conservation treatments. Since 2007, she has participated and coordinated a series of collaborative projects between the Universita di Firenze and the National School of Restoration, INA, related to nanoscience applied to conservation of cultural heritage. She has been involved in the activities of the LATAM CNCP CP ICROM program on stone conservation from 2014 to the date, and she was part of the organization of the International Stone Conservation Course of the ICROM. She worked on conservation and restoration projects for the INA for over 15 years in various archaeological areas of the country. And since 2017, she is a researcher at the Institute of Aesthetic Research of the National Autonomous University of Mexico. Welcome, Dr. Jarelli, and it's a pleasure to have you here with us. Her conference is called Experiences and Approach to Mexican Archaeological Heritage from the Point of View of Science and Conservation. Good evening in Mexico, good morning in Cambodia. First of all, I want to thank to the organizers for this wonderful invitation to take part in this colloquium, to share experiences with different professionals and different countries, something that is wonderful. And as Fernando said, I thank him this for this invitation. Starting from the original project, why did I decide to study restoration? As you could see in my CV, I am art restorer. 
And here, for example, in Mexico, all restorers study all kinds of materials. We are not specialized in only one type of materials. We study photo, ceramics, stone, mural painting, and so on more. And only to put this conference in context, I want to explain why do I mix science with art. These are two passions in my life. At the beginning, I wanted to be a physician because both of my parents are physicians and I didn't know about this career until I had the chance to look at the art part mixed with science in restoration and all the archaeological heritage in Mexico has been my passion so this is a little bit of what my presentation includes in Mexico, there is plenty of archaeological heritage, and I am going to focus more on the experience I've had, which is about the curative elements and coatings in architecture present in archaeological areas. Some of the problems of these elements and the approach to cultural heritage in terms of conservation, preventive and direct conservation. And I will show some cases of study that I could see in one of the areas of the National Institute of Anthropology and History. I've worked in an interdisciplinary project along different stages and I have been able to combine these two points of view, how to undertake cultural heritage and I will look forward for your questions. Conservation in general can be understood as the general set of technical operations with the aim of enlarging the life of cultural property. And this is what I was interested in since the beginning, because this, instead of treating humans, is to treat art and remains. And this is made respecting the physical integrity and the information and respecting the meaning. As I was telling you at the beginning, I'll talk about the curative elements and coatings present in archaeological areas. In most of the presentations, we have been that lecturers are archaeologists. So now you will see what restorers work in archaeological sites. We work with plaster and coatings with elements that recover the structures with stucco and this includes floors and plasters stucco is every any material in which lime is used we can also find exempt elements it, this is isolated elements such as sculptures or others there are coating elements. This is the Bonampak archaeological area in Chiapas. And why are we interested in this? It's because in every area of the country we have different materials and different materials and different kinds of decorations. In past times local materials were used to intervene these works. And these will vary according to the date and place. Here we have the murals from Teotihuacan, which have certain pigments, or there are others as those found in Cacaxtla, Tlaxcala. These are some examples. It's not mural painting, but these are some decorative elements that can be found in the pilasters in different archaeological areas. These elements not necessarily need to have colors. We can find different drawings in, on plaster that can even end up being a history or a description of a fact. Here we find again the area of Ekbalam in Yucatan. And here we can see these stucco coatings. And this can have or not polychromy. These are called patoles, which resemble a game, a pre-Hispanic game, and some symbolic elements. 
this is what we meant as modeled elements. These are some architectural elements made with plaster, lime plaster. And these elements can be, can have color or not. These can be found inside some rooms or holes. Other elements in the archaeological site of Ekbalam. These are some elements found on corners in buildings. These have different elements like the monster of the, like the earth monster and other elements. And some are just decorative elements in different architectural parts. These are some details on the main facade in the archaeological area without polychromy, but these have extraordinary elements made with the materials. There were also reliefs on stone, covered on the stone, and the materials, the constituent materials change in the different areas. Here we find sandstone and there we can see chak. This is in the archaeological area of Chicana in Campeche. And to the right, we see a picture of the archaeological area of Mayapan in Yucatan. Those works in stone is very important, even though they date from different times. This is the archaeological site of Hormiguero in Campeche. And there is a representation of the earth monster that's the mouth of the monster. We can see the fangs, the eyes, and all the associated elements to that representation. This is another example of another somorphic figure and sculpture in the area of Chicana Campeche. And there is the detail of another one. This is found in Yucatan. These are representations of the god Chac, the god of the rain. And we can see entire facades with these materials. All of these have different technologies. This is the archaeological area of Mitla in Oaxaca. And these stone reliefs can be in inner parts or on the outside. And they can be worked for meters and meters. And these have been carefully carved and require special treatments for their care. Another example, as we can see here, and as you could see in the first conference of this colloquium, this is Teotihuacan, there is another stone material which is called basalt, and it was polychromed. This belongs to the temple of Quetzalcoatl in Teotihuacan in the state of Mexico. As you can see, the weather changes, and therefore the materials and techniques. This element is found in the archaeological site of Tula Hidalgo. It has different elements. These are carved on stone. They had not a base for preparation, so the pigment was placed directly on the stone. We have exempt or isolated elements. Some of them can partially be adjoined to the structure and some are isolated. So later, these are the famous Chacmol sculptures in Chichen Itza, Yucatan, or some details in the archaeological site of Ekbalam. This is in San Luis Potosí, the archaeological site of Tamtok. This is a great element. This was carved in only one piece of stone, and some are other structures isolated. This is to have an idea of the materials we deal with. Some stele for with um, writing elements of the Mayas. This is from the areas of Calakmul and El Palmar in Campeche. Here is another example in Chichen Itza, Yucatan. In the Temple of Warriors, we can see different individuals and these are unique. This is not a model that is repeated. Each one is unique and each one depicts a warrior. Here we can see the warriors. We can see the details here. All of them used to be polychromed, but they lose the color. These were found in a previous constructive stage. 
which is found inside the temple. And this way we can see how they preserve the polychrome elements. Other stone elements, such as the Bacal tomb, inside the Palenque area of Chiapas, or these monoliths of La Venta Tabasco. This is one of the earliest in Mexico. This is from the Olmec culture, or this great Tlaloc, which is found in the city of Mexico at the entrance of the National Museum of Anthropology and History. The objectives to approach to this cultural heritage is to identify the constitutive materials of this cultural property, how were they used, and how can we use them in restoration works. Also to determine the degree of decay of the cultural property to deal with. I've showed you a wide range. And this will help us to determine the materials and treatments to solve the problems of conservation of each of these examples. And something very important is that we do not intervene any piece alone. We need to intervene in an integral way, in an interdisciplinary way, working with different experts in other fields and other disciplines. And this is how we need to undertake a project, a restoration project in archaeological areas. Some of the problems of conservation that we have in mural painting are the salts. They crystallize and start degrading the materials and we can have problems such as these that we can see. It's very important to know the techniques of how these paintings were made. In the case of frescoes, temple, and which materials are we going to use to rest to restore these paintings? We really need to know all the materials with which these were made. Something that can work fine in a country, in another country may not work the same. The weather and geography, geographic places require different types of materials. For example, polymers have been very useful to restore some kinds of paintings, but we really need to know if the materials can work that way. Otherwise, we can fa face problems like this with the touching of paintings. And then restorers need to intervene and remove these paintings and as well as other materials that damage the structures like cement. But sometimes it's required to give stability to structures, but we need to use materials that may not cause damage because sometimes the damage can be irreversible. There are different manners to approach interventions for restoration, it depends on the cause of the damage. It can be uh, due to natural phenomena. There is direct intervention, but we need a diagnosis to know what we need to do. So we need to know all the materials, the history of the property since it was created until our days. We need to locate the property to know if it has tourism, which are the weathering causes of decay and so on. So we need to, to investigate and to apply the correct materials for restoration, as well as to be careful with the criteria for the restoration. There are international criteria that are used worldwide. And one of the basic criteria is to have a minimum intervention to use compatible materials and that these materials can be reversible in order to retreat the property if needed. The methodology to approach the restoration of this cultural property can be given with the support of scientists and 
other disciplines to identify the constitutive materials to evaluate the degradation or to know which materials have been used in previous restorations. We need to know what has happened with the property and we not always ha can have materials information available. We can pose the use of new materials to treat the problem that has been detected and then we need to evaluate the efficiency through small tests and we need to work as i have mentioned with different disciplines for example with mural painting we need to analyze through different different testings to know about the agglutinant, which is the material that brings together the different pigments. And this is one of the studies of paintings in the place that we are going to see later. And some materials that have been degraded, we need to evaluate. For example, here, some salts were were damaging the sculptures and we need to know that in order to use the adequate materials. This is the identification of polymers applied on surfaces. Here we, uh, we had to perform some tests and some studies to identify the polymers. In different times in Mexico, different polymers were used. Here is a study of the cellulose nitrate utilized in Tulum, in Mexico. Other kinds of actions, once we have detected the problems, is to understand and to try to prevent or to apply the actions of preventive conservation. In most of the archaeological sites, water is a problem. So first we need to deviate and channel water so that water does not continue affecting the monuments. Sometimes we need to add elements to cover the structures to prevent water to continue deteriorating plasters and paintings. And we can protect the roofs and we can protect the floors and we also need to use different methods to take water away from the buildings. This is in Tlatelolco in the middle of Mexico City and that is mural paintings and we need to use different devices to allow water evaporation to prevent that moisture can continue deteriorating the mural painting. The same is made with stucco elements, that is to open spaces to interrupt the pass of water, the passing of water through the monuments, and these are some of the technical resources used in prevention in different archaeological areas. Another one has been the to recover some areas using thin layers of limestone, reproducing the texture of the stones. And this way we are going to protect the materials. And this is called like a sacrifice material, which is added to prevent deterioration on the original materials. This is in Rio Bec Campeche. This element, this decorative panel is the facade of entrance to a monument and the jungle had, had grown over the monument and thanks to research it was possible to restore this monument and it was recovered with sacrifice materials. And then the salts are deteriorating the new materials. When we change the 
natural conditions of the monuments, different changes, chemical changes in materials occur, and some accelerate the de deterioration. So we add these materials in order to control this deterioration and the appearance of salts. Other techniques that have been used is to rebury some of the materials and this occurs when we cannot give maintenance to these materials and during excavations these elements are buried again using the same techniques and using materials that are going to protect the originals this is a patoli and this was reburied as it was not exposed to the public, so all the procedures for its conservation were performed and it was reburied. These materials can be liberated again. These were temporary elements that were discovered during an archaeological intervention. And these had some materials, and this had to be protected before the vegetation would grow again and damage these paintings. Here there was a landslide, and these elements had to be protected. In other cases, this is the case of Mayapan in Yucatan. This was a floor that was decorated and it had different conservation problems. This was in charge of Dr. Claudia Garcia. And with her restoration team, they cleaned the painting, they made a copy and they reburied the element. What is made here is to rebury the archaeological element and the copy is placed so that the visitors can appreciate it, but it's not the original. The original has been reburied in order to preserve it. The other part is all the covering elements that can be added in archaeological sites. And this is the placing of roofs and covers to preserve archaeological elements. There we can see the Templo Mayor in the middle of the Mexico City and in other places with different weathers. So in some cases, the solution is to put a roof to protect the structures. This is a proposal made by archaeologist Ramon Carrasco in Balacamu, Campeche. This was an element that was found and his proposal went through different stages. And as, as this was an earlier constructive stage, he replaced the materials in the last stage. That is the replica of the structure and inside this was made in order to res to respect the visual and in the inside we could appreciate the monument the archaeological area of Tule Hidalgo was worked in an integral way it is located on an industrial area there is a refinery a thermoelectric cement plant so it's a very polluted area and all the materials were suffering damage and were degraded. These were some of the studies performed. An interdisciplinary work was done in order to document all the damages. And at the beginning of this colloquium, we mentioned, Master Fernando mentioned that register is basic to preserve the heritage. Here are all the examples of the register and of the tests performed. Here, they also changed the cover. 
this was made at the moment of the excavation and along the years, well, it didn't work any longer. Here we can see the degree of deterioration. It lose the polychromy and it began to be more degraded. All the restoration processes were undertaken. It was clean, the polymers were removed. They were put, brought together again on the place. And in some moment, all the, all the materials materials, all the drawings were recovered and the reading could be recovered after these works. This is part of the change of the roof. At the beginning it was like that and these are pictures of the process of the construction of the new roof. And all the architectural elements were armed again. In this archaeological area, the work with the biology area was very important, not only to identify all the materials, but also to put special covers in order to prevent fires and also to place green walls made with plants so that the wind would no, no longer damage the materials. This also helps to reforest the area and this was made with original trees and plants from the area. This is part of my research for the doctor degree, which is the nanomaterials. These are used for consolidation. This is a, like the images presented at the beginning. Calcium hydroxide nanoparticles, which is water with lime. And these materials has been used to consolidate mural painting for a long time, but this is made at nanometric scale. So materials become more reactive. And the first stage is to try with small pieces. These are from Kalakmul and systematic testing was made in order to see if there was a change of color or a greater response in terms of consolidation in order to avoid using synthetic polymers. And by using these materials, which are the same, used to support mural paintings, do not affect the structures. Here we have performed the studies of water absorption and some of the examples that we are going to present is Ixcaquixtla in Puebla. This was found because a lady was building her house and when the, the truck with the materials came in, it went down and therefore it was discovered. Here we can see a chamber with three, with three rooms and we found this mural painting, which is wonderful. This is very low, a, a person cannot be standing there. This is not a fresco, this is a temple painting with different materials that were adhered with a certain gum. This is really wonderful. The problem is that when the excavation began, it was discovered that all the painting was being lost due to the salts. Here, the salts are making the painting to the, be detached. Also, there were other problems that were affecting the painting in the tomb. All the stucco was detaching complete and we were losing the painting. So with this material, this material was treated with the nanoparticles. And we also made all the 
preventive restoration works. And this is just to show you how fast the degradation of the mural painting has been done. We had to apply treatments to remove the salts and to fix the color on the surface again. Everything using different treatments and different nanostructured materials. And here you can see the before and the after of some of the treatments applied on this mural painting. This is another example. As you can see here, the disgregation caused by salts, it's very hard. This is when we were determining the concentration of the materials to be used. And as you can see, the recovery of the addition of the pigment to the wall is wonderful. And therefore, we could know all the next steps. Do you remember the columns that I showed you in Chichen Itza at the beginning? In this substructure, the pigments were supported, were just adhered through salt. So we had to perform different studies, one of them by Dr. Claudia Garcia, which is responsible for this site, and all the consolidation tests were made. They performed the monitoring for various years, studying all the salts. And here, the preventive restoration was fundamental. So that's why it is important to work with an interdisciplinary teams. And that's the adequate in order to understand all the problems faced by this property. These are some of the paintings found in the archaeological area of Calakmul in Campeche. Archaeologist Ramon Carrasco also worked here. And these are some of the problems that mural painting faced. And below, we can see the consolidation of these paintings. These are other examples. And something very important has been working with the restoration schools, the School of Mexico City, the school in Guadalajara, and the school in San Luis Potosí, where they are learning to use all these nanostructured materials to be applied in cultural heritage. Another material that has been widely used is in the case of the Tlaltecutli, found at the Templo Mayor, the restoration was made by Maria Barajas after the discovery of Dr. Leonardo Lopez Luján. They did a spectacular work on that stone. And I just intervened some years ago when Diana Medellín was in charge of the maintenance of this stone. This stone is exposed inside the museum. It's a large monolith and dust is deposited on the surface. So twice a year, it has to be cleaned. This has been consolidated. The painting coat has been consolidated, but we need to to clean it and the tourist poured oil on it. So it was decided to try a different way of cleaning it that was through hails, as this used to be vacuum cleaned before. We tried to prove different ways to clean this stone. And we proved the use of these hails. This hail is made with distilled water and some other substances, and it was used to remove the dust, especially in those areas with reliefs, because with other materials, it's very hard to clean them without damaging the painting. 
as you can see here, this gel is a chemical gel. And this can be applied, then it can be rinsed and can be used many times. It can be used around 15 times per side, and it provides a very effective cleansing. And this can be, this is a way of cleaning manually all these parts. Here is the washing of the materials, and this is and here you can see the proportions of this element, and this is the picture after the cleansing with the gel. And thank you very much for your attention. I went a little far because I was not sure about the time I had, and I don't know if you have questions. First of all, thank you to Dr. Jareli Haidar for this presentation about the techniques of conservation applied to different archaeological contexts in Mexico. Thank you very much, Doctor. And there are some questions. One of the questions is asking if there were human remains in the tomb with the little animals. No, there were no human remains. There was just ceramics. The images I showed you were from the main chamber and only ceramics and some stones were found, but no human remains. In that area, there is no archeological evidence. So everything is at the level of the soil. So the only valuable that we found was this magnificent mural painting, which faces a great problem because it's in a particular property and we cannot access to the site. And it was intended to make a copy to be visited, a copy on the surface, but it cannot be accessed because it's not very high and hardly a person can go in to visit it. Okay, to answer the question of Helen Jarvis about the sacrificing materials, she's going to put the presentation back. What is made is that the sacrificing coatings can be used like putting a protective coating. For example, in the case of stone, the problem here was the quality of the stone that due to the salt, it was starting to be degraded because the salts were crystallizing. And first of all, we need to place channels for the water on the cornice. These elements were closed to prevent water falling on the stone. and the stone was consolidated with lime water, with water with lime, improving the percentage of calcium until, until the stone was stable. This was made along two months until the stone was stabilized again. Then we had to place a lime mortar coat of around one centimeter with very few lime. And then the relief is marked 
and we leave it very porous so that crystals can be formed on the outer part. And when these salts start to harden, what they break is the sacrificing material. In this case, we can see the thickness of the coating and there we can see the salts crystallizing on the surface of this coating. So we lose the coating, but we can replace it again. And this is only made when there is no much chance to control the salts. First of all, we should need to control the causes, but if we can't, we can constantly be placing these sacrificing materials to prevent causing damage to the original structures. I don't know if this explanation can answer my question. We are going to close the session now. And we are inviting all of you to accompany us tomorrow. Tomorrow we have the conference of Dr. Fu Chan, who is going to talk about the works, the restoration works in Angkor Thom. It's going to be very interesting. So we look forward to seeing all of you tomorrow through the channel La Buena Impresión in YouTube. And for further information, you can check the Facebook page of La Buena Impresión. And thank you very much to Dr. Yareli Haidar for her presentation.